So welcome back to the second day of Domitora 2022. And I'm pleased to uh, introduce this, uh, or pleased to kind of introduce the chair of this panel, uh, Grazia. So if you can uh, go ahead and introduce the other panelists. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much, uh, Martin, for introducing uh, panel number four, Rights, Copies, Rights, Postcolonial Case Studies in Early Cinema. Um, unfortunately, there's been a change in the number of presenters during the panel, so uh, I will not present uh, my paper today. Um, and we will have presentations um, starting with uh, Alison Griffith's um, paper presentation. Alison is Distinguished Professor of Film and Media Studies at uh, Baruch College uh, CUNY. And um, uh, Alison's uh, paper will be followed by um, Mark Williams' paper, um, Professor of Film and Media at Dartmouth College. And, um, the last presenter will be Abu Bakar Sanogo, um, professor in cinematic arts at Carlton University. Um, so um, as our um, panel title suggests, uh, this panel interrogates the presence um, of formerly colonized people before and behind the camera, that is their rights to film and be filmed, broadly speaking. Um, so uh, without further ado, I would uh, leave the floor uh, to um, Alison that will um, talk about the intertribal Indian ceremonial gallop. Um, and uh, the floor is yours, um, Alison, and then we I will uh, collect questions that will have popped up in the chat, and then we can have a discussion after the three panelists' presentations. Um, Alison, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, or it's morning for me, but um, hello to fellow dormitorians. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm presenting my paper on the traditional lands of the Upper Skagit people in the Pacific Northwest, and I pay my respect to elders both past and present. Okay. Sorry, just... Okay, I'm hoping everybody can see that. The centennial of the intertribal Indian ceremonial, a celebration of Native American dance, visual and material culture is scheduled to take place over 10 days in Gallup, New Mexico this August. Ceremonial, as I shall refer to it in this talk, and the highlight of the Gallup cultural calendar since its inauguration in 1922. Despite the fraught history surrounding Gallup's economic and social struggles, Native American scholar Kent Blancet calls it a quote, really contested place, unquote. Political wrangling and maneuvering involving state bureaucracies and the exploitation of Diné, formerly Navajo peoples by Anglo businesses, the community holds on to ceremonial as a powerful symbol of Native American culture, resilience, and self-determination. Ceremonial is Gallup, the two entities imbricated in a web of civic, spiritual, commercial, and touristic activities and priorities. Visual history is celebrated in Gallup's architecture with 20 murals of the city's past filling public walls, many of them dating to the WPA New Deal Public Arts Project and filled with problematic imagery, a constant reminder of Gallup's history as a represented place. Films made at the ceremonial from the silent era, recording dances, parades, horses and foot races, tug of war, act as a prism through which to parse grapple with questions of cultural ownership, access, visual rep repatriation, also referred to as digital return, counter narrative to official history, translation, resignification, cultural patrimony, memory work, counter memory, shared or devolved authority, and alternative epistemologies and frames of reference. 
The ceremonial visual imprint is both material, comprised of artifacts that could be held, bought, displayed, lost, hidden, and imaginary, an effective economy of memories laminated from generation to generation, passed on orally through what um, visual anthropologist Elizabeth Edward calls, quote, a matrix of the subjectivities of experience, embodiment, and emotion, end quote, of everyone who has ever attended ceremonial. Inspired by Edward's insistence that we embrace the tension between affect and evidence in anthropological image making, a tension that she claims has defined the field of anthropology since its emergence in the late 19th century. I want to consider the ways in which a counter historical narrative is not only latent in the textual surfaces of the extant films, but can be activated in the memory work of digital return. The second her hermeneutic I want to explore relates to questions of social engagement especially the patrimony of films originally intended for one use and enlisted for another, with few restrictions on how they continue to mean and to matter. The films of Gallup ceremonial that I screened for community members in small groups of two to three people at the Octavia Fellon Public Library in fall of, 19, of 2021 consisted of Camping Among the Indians from the Special Collections Department of the American Museum of Natural History made in 1927 by Edward Thomas Seaton, naturalist, writer, and founder of the Woodcraft League and American Boy Scouts, and AM and H curator, Clyde Fisher. The film may finally have found a substantial audience since its initial exposure at the AM and H in the 1920s was paltry. While fragments may have been used in the Dramagraph, a prototype of contemporary interactive viewing stations in the museum gallery, the entire film was never shown in public programming and it quickly fell into obscurity. The other two films are amateur, fo amateur footage of ceremonial embedded with home movies of family vacation made by the geologist William Rather, who later served as director of the United States Geological Survey between 1943 and 56. The films are housed at the Human Studies Film Archive at the Nas National Anthropological Archive, part of the Smithsonian Institution in DC, and made some time between 1926 and 1932. The interviews I conducted fell into the broad category of recovery work, indigenizing the historical archive in order to center what Joanna Hearn sees as indigenous media genealogies. I argue that the effective response of watching amateur films of Gallup ceremonial opens up a discursive space for storytelling that is culturally contingent, defined by indigenous life ways that reactivate memory and in the process of recollection, create something new, if not necessarily something everyone agrees on. This requires letting go of interpretive models that view the films through an a priori lens of cultural reification recognizing that textual analysis fails to address the emotional impact of viewing repatriated media. For example, as our historian Cal Payne's research on the responses of Inuit elders to community photographs shared by young Inuit adults revealed a fascinating disconnect between standard colonial critiques and recognition of the use value of historical images. According to Payne, where she saw evidence of, quote, subjugation, othering, and enforced cultural assimilation dressed in the cheerful colors of jingoist nationalism, end quote. The Inuit saw, quote, family members, long lost neighbors, hunting techniques, social gatherings, and old friends, end quote. Recuperated as indigenous screen memories, Faye Ginsburg's term for the resignification of archival material as well as new works by Aboriginal media makers that celebrate their collective stories and histories, Gallup's filmic path is not distant and removed from contemporary life, but intimately bound up with personal as well as social memory. As expert witnesses and animated storytellers, the respondents took their roles as gatekeepers of the memory of ceremonial very seriously. For example, several respondents underscored the fact that, that the dances taking up considerable screen time were social dances rather than desanctified for public presentation and not the same as those performed during feast days. One respondent pointed out that for a period of time, Diné dances at the summer ceremonial featured sacred winter Yebiche dances used when a sick person needs healing 
in which a white clay called Gleish was painted onto the body. This was highly irregular, as one time explained to me. So when they perform like that, they have to pray and sing. There's a medicine man involved in that. You can't just go out and do that yourself. There's a consequence to that. You might lose your eyesight, end quote. Tactics for desanctifying dances, including attaching symbolic objects such as eagle feathers to the wrong part of the body, were inadequate for these respondents, who objected to the sacrilegious implications of including Yebiche dances in ceremonial. Grievances were similarly aired about the religious meaning of the Apache Gan dance, misidentified as an Apache devil dance rather than a dance in our honor of the spirits that lived in nearby mountains. Cinema had triggered complex questions about the cultural authorization of religious dances. One Diné man speculating that the sacred, sacred eagle feathers worn by dances must have been the subject of discussion, perhaps involving, quote, meetings among their spiritual leaders, medicine men to approve that, to bring it over here, and to try to put it into the forms of a social performance, end quote. This corroborates Diné writer Irene Stewart's belief that some medicine men had become unscrupulous over time, shedding ancient beliefs and transforming ceremonies into public shows to gain profits instead of for healing purposes. Opening up about ceremonial's history and memory authorized all manner of personal disclosure, such as one Anglo man's admission to me that back in the 1950s at ceremonial, quote, you could wear a headdress even though you weren't a Plains Indian. And then all the people, immediately they'd recognize me as an Indian or accept me as an Indian if I wore a headdress. Gallup's carnivalesque and heterotopic atmosphere, a bit like that of the Wild West and Midways of World's Fairs, brought center and periphery into collision, with tourist travel to Gallup unleashing the imaginative capacities of middle-class Americans. In this formulation, as Karen Kaplan has used the melancholic lamentation for quote, already, already, sorry, always already vanquished spaces of kinds of subjects, paradise, home, the native, end quote, could be temporarily put on hold as indigenous imaginaries were allowed to flow freely throughout the five days of ceremonial. Cinema served as an agent provocateur for Native Americans wanting to construct a counter narrative of ceremonial, one in which a darker pall was cast over its celebratory image although pleasure at the remembering triggered by the films was also quite palpable. This new communicative situation, born of what photo elicitation scholars see as a second order projective form of interviewing, one that exceeds the initial encyclopedic or indexical meaning of images, is a powerful reminder of the need not just to account for resistant readings, but to acknowledge the role of affect in stirring up emotions about the expropriation of religious life for ceremonial parades and demonstrations. For the Diné woman whose husband had voiced concerned about, concerns about sacrilegious dances, watching films of ceremonial compared her to share a traumatic story. And with a voice reminiscent of what Anishinaabe scholar Gerald Visenor calls survivance, defined by an active sense of presence. In addition, in addition to introducing herself in the Diné language, on several occasions, she, she switched from English to her native tongue, affirming Diné poet Lucy Tapahonso's argument that the Navajo language lends itself well to rich quantitative allusions to time, surrounding physical conditions, and historical as well as spiritual imagery. It was also a strong assertion of her indig indigeneity. One of the stories the woman shared was an early memory of attending ceremonial with her mother who spoke only Diné. The story focused on a recollection of an Anglo woman who befriended them both, asking the mother whether she could take the little girl as part of an unsanctioned impromptu adoption. She almost take me that lady, the woman recounted, adding that, quote, if my mom had said yes, I would have been somewhere else, end quote. This memory, a metonymy for the US government's forceful removal of Native American children to boarding schools where they suffered emotional, psychological, verbal, and even physical abuse, elucidates the role of film in affirming cultural survival, albeit through the activation of memories that lie beneath its surface. But the Diné woman's psychic re-entry into the world of ceremonial via the films made blatantly obvious 
was the fact that the films don't simply represent space and culture, but a reliving of experience in a hybrid public private realm. What Dutch media scholar Van Giekkot determines, quote, mediated memories, sites of struggle or negotiation. According to Van Giek, quote, there is not, nor has there ever been a sharp distinction between public and private, since every act of memory involves a negotiation of the boundaries between these spheres, end quote. Interlink interlinking past and present, the film's function is intermediaries between an individual and a culture, invoking the sensory ambience and emotional landscape of distinct memories, memories tethered to the filmmaker as a seeing subject, but also enfolding into transcendent memories of Gallup that are simultaneously public and private. The idea of gallery as a memory scape, Mark Nuttall's term for the sensual and mental apprehension of environment he developed in conjunction with Inuit of Northwest Greenland, where technologically mediated memories of an absent filmmaker transmogrify into public and second level personal memories is a fitting heuristic for making sense of gallop, oh, sorry, of ceremonial as bound to specific space, one that is both tangible and imaginary. Native American connection with place goes beyond the desire for harmonization and is, as Tiwe tribe member Gregory A. Cajete argues, quote, not a romantic notion out of step with the times, but rather the quintessential ecological mandate of our times, end quote. Beyond the circumscribed context of the scholarly oral history interview, how my amateur films of ceremonial activate historical memory within a framework of community re regeneration, where the films might assume new meaning and relevance. There are no rules about how a community might become socially engaged with archival films. And I saw expressions of excitement as well as reticence in the people I interviewed. The broader question of how these films might contribute to Native American modalities of, quote, doing history, rituals that are enmeshed in mythological narratives, what Alfonso Ortiz sees as processes of anchoring social events onto symbolic vehicles of expression that are traditional and that lock these events comfortably onto their own cultural landscape, and I apologize, that was actually a quote, is intriguing, and some of my respondents had definite ideas about what should be done with these films. For example, a Lagoon Holy Woman I interviewed, someone who'd been involved at the highest organizational level of ceremonial, had few problems imagining ways of resignifying the films. The way I see it, she said, this is a true history of the event and that it should be perpetuated in a way that honors it. She felt the task of ensuring a future for the films should fall on the shoulders of current participants, some of whom were the seventh or eighth generation to take part. I believe it's them that approaches the tribe to say, this is what we want to keep as part of our tribal archives, end quote. She imagined the films being projected at the Gallup Cultural Center with um, contemporary Ola maidens dancing in front of, as you see here, um, footage from a 1927 film of Ola maidens, um, reacting to the footage of their historical counterparts. The melding of past and present through dance and cinema would then be filmed so that future generations could re-encounter and renegotiate the meanings of ceremonial in its earliest articulation. That's a treasure right there, she said, because you're getting the true reaction of what they remember and even possibly what could be in the future, end quote. Compared to contemporary video of the ceremonial, the truth value of their archival films was significantly higher for the respondent. Back then she noted, it was really legit, the it referencing both ceremonial and film. And then by, by osmosis, she argued, it starts becoming a bit commercialized and a little bit more commercialized. And then we are where we are today, where film is valuable, but not in a way it was in the past which is the legitimacy of what our culture was. What we film today is the product of what colonialism and tourism and everything has produced now. It's a show now. It's how bright can my feathers be? It's entertainment, end quote. A Diné man was more circumspect when asked whether the film should be repatriated, deferring to the authority of the Navajo Nation Historic Preservation in Window Rock, Arizona who he said, if presented with the films, 
would make a determination similar to the return of religious artifacts. Diné experts, he believed, would, quote, know what the films mean and how they should be used. And what for some was just film, he argued, for others there would be deeper meanings. As remediated artifacts, the film's place within a Diné, Diné archival memory was no means guaranteed for this man, but subject to approval from a higher Diné authority. I want to end by making two observations about the repatriation of ethnographic film to indigenous communities. First, as examples of mediated memories, films are imbricated in complex constellations of race, culture, identity, place, and narrative. Their meanings as much up for grabs today as they were in the 20s and 30s, an era when they were shown as fragments of the AM and H in one case and privately screened for Rather's family. One assumes they were screened, we have no evidence in the second. The latent power of these films ironically lies in their marginality, a concept I'm working with in a new project on vernacular cinema and, in, and indigeneity that views the margins as both a literal and metaphorical space of re resistance and recovery and vibrancy. Second, thinking about how affect and issues of rights around archival films, both in a legal and social justice sense, are mutually constituted might help us better understand how watching films invokes self-referencing, a process when incoming information from a viewing experience is both elaborated on and compared to someone's own memory. The affordances between film and memory are fluid, formal, and effective. And while images themselves cannot narrate experience, individuals can, partaking in what Martha Langford calls performative viewing. Moreover, remembering and expressing, as well as forgetting and repressing, are, as Linda Manick argues, part and parcel of the myriad emotions involved in looking at archival images. Sensual memories attributed not only to the visual track, but triggered by olfactory, auditory, and as Proust famously observed in Swan's way, gustatory cues. Seeing ceremonial through the lens of amateur footage is a complex act of reimagining one in which original viewing positions, while never entirely deracinated, step aside for new interlocutors. Thanks. If I have an extra minute, I don't know how I did on time, Grazie, but I have a clip from Gallup. I think that uh, we can, we have time to see that. Can you, can everybody hear the sound on it? I, no. I, I can't. No. Oh. Okay. Um, I think I did not click the optimize for sound when I shared my screen. So, um, yeah, just do it again. Yeah. All right, I'll just stop sharing and let me just share it again. Oh, and I did it again. So sorry. Ah, <laughs> oh, boy. Hold on. There we go. Oh, all right. Okay. It's, um, that's not going to happen. It's asking me to restart my media. All right. I'm so sorry. Um, I can actually find the link and put it into the chat for this clip from YouTube during the Q and A. Right. Okay. So we'll stop there. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Alison, for um, this fascinating uh, case study and for introducing some of the terms that uh, um, the other two presenters uh, will also refer to and that we can continue um, discussing in the in the Q&A. So I would like to introduce um, Mark Williams paper, um, which uh, will uh, address the idea of Africa within the US archival um, uh, silent era, within archival silent era film collections. And I know that uh, um, uh, Mark will probably uh, address a recent research uh, uh, at the Stember, in the Stember collection. So I will leave the um, um, floor to Mark and uh, we'll have time to discuss um, later. Thank you. Great, thank you, Grazia. <clears throat> can, uh, can you all see my screen, my slide set? Yes, we can. 
great. Okay, so uh, my presentation is framed within the Media Ecology Project. Uh, and it's kind of a, a, an update, a report on a fairly new undertaking that's extremely exciting, um, having to do with a, a new course here at Dartmouth that we have been enabled to teach and will teach several times, a course on the idea of Africa. Um, it is a pet project of my wonderful colleague, Professor Ayo Coley, who's the chair of African and African American studies at Dartmouth. And because of some of the recent um, new participations in media ecology, it enabled uh, this course to really sort of catch fire. So uh, you're probably, you might be familiar with MEP. This is our WordPress site. We're not seeing the full screen. If you can go back to oh, the slideshow. What, what are you seeing? Like your whole desktop. Oh. Just hit okay. play again. So hit the slideshow again. Like that? Yes. Yes. That's better? OK. Perfect. That's just gigantic for me. I'm trying. To, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> so silly. OK. Um, yeah, that's our WordPress site. We are so um, honored to have received an NEH grant to produce um, an initial study of uh, visual cultures uh, through silent film collections. And we're dealing with primarily uh, US film archives in this regard. Um, if you'd like an introduction to that project and how it's going, we're, we've got a um, quite detailed essay in digital, hum digital humanities quarterly. And I hope that you'll uh, check that out. Regarding this conference, I think probably um, my paper will most directly uh, correspond to the following three um, uh, topics that were that were proposed. Thinking about copyright as preservation, we're working with the paper prints in the Library of Congress, uh, scholarship and teaching, and impacts of digital media and the internet. So we have carved, I think, a, an interesting niche uh, regarding these issues. And uh, they are truly intrinsic topics for media ecology, outreach goals, and our relationships to our archival partners. And the idea of Africa course is, I think, an interesting example of that. So our goals are to realize a sustainability project regarding media history as public memory, develop networked scholarship. This is a really key part of the digital bit. Um, promote the dynamic ecology, this notion of the dynamic ecology of historical media. Most people, frankly, don't know that historical media are imperiled. They see, for example, a thousand new cat videos an hour on YouTube, and they imagine that moving image culture is eternal and uh, ubiquitous, and neither thing is true. Uh, we're really working with archives to realize what we refer to as a virtuous cycle by virtue of archival access to archival content, we can grow new 21st century interdisciplinary scholarship that grows the field, if you will, but also uh, adds value back to the archive. So we support the essential work of the archives. We engage primary research, both in arts and humanities, close reading and STEM uh, distant reading explore new research questions that were previously unimaginable and innovate new forms of scholarship and publication. So for the, uh, the silent film collections project, the, this isn't even a complete list, but we're, we're collating a number of extraordinary resources in relationship to one another. And those that are listed here in blue uh, have been significant to the idea of Africa course. I'm going to be emphasizing the Sherman Grinberg Library today. Um, that participation occurred after quite a number of months of conversations. And um, they have generously agreed to instantiate a, a memorandum of understanding with us and really want us to help them to realize the value of their collection uh, to higher education. And I'll say more about that 
uh, relationship in a minute, but it's really um, every every relationship to an archive is distinctive and sometimes idiosyncratic. This is a great example of how scholarship can really uh, help to improve workflows at an archive and uh, make so much more historical media available to people. Uh, that's the beginning of the syllabus for the course. With IO, we were we received a special grant from the Dean of the Faculty, and we'll be able to offer this course at least three times. So we literally just finished grading yesterday um, for the spring term. So we have a, a little bit of experience now with it, and it's going to continue to grow and develop uh, as we continue to teach it. Uh, I also should note that both Grazia and Abubakar gave extraordinary lectures for the course. So they have my back here, hopefully, and they can expand on their own approaches to this. Um, so there are a couple of quotes that I like to frame my projects in. Uh, Benjamin's sense that every now is the now of a specific recognizability for MEP, we love to work with what I call fugitive archives. So there's always something where we haven't seen before, or at least no one has seen recently. And uh, I love working with that kind of frisson. And then uh, a great quote from Catherine Grew, if we're separated from film artifacts and audiences, what is the imaginative or dialogical work that takes place across the distance? This is always the question that we're asking. What new historiographic modes, ambiguous, fabulative, speculative, do these artifacts and our separation from them demand? Um, this is a quote that itself is very situational and I think depends a lot on the particular research project. Um, I use this quote for a forthcoming essay in feminist media histories that's about early television and performers who were passing. That's a, that's a very different kind of object and a very different kind of study than what this idea of Africa course is about because uh, part of what has been so instructive and so exciting about the course is that uh, by working with uh, contemporary African writers and filmmakers providing a framework, we have uh, not only new historiographic insights, but an absolutely resolute parallax of perspective. So the intervention of these writers and these filmmakers is directly related to the historiographic issues and questions that we're raising. And that is an amazing and productive framework by which to proceed. Um, so for example, here's a great quote from Akile Mbembe on the post-colony. It's now widely acknowledged that Africa as an idea, a concept has historically served and continues to serve as a polemical argument for the West's desperate desire to assert its difference from the rest of the world. In several respects, Africa still constitutes one of the metaphors through which the West represents the origin of its own norms develops a self-image and integrates this image into the set of signifiers asserting what it supposes to be its identity. That draws a very specific historiographic line and uh, absolutely conditions and informs our responses to the materials that, we, um, that we're discovering. So this is probably well known to all of you, but nevertheless, the graphics and the, um, the, the uh, statistics are pretty stunning. After 1870 and more dramatically after the Berlin Conference in 1884 and 85, there was a remarkable increase in the European acquisition of colonial territories in the South Pacific, Asia and Africa. Uh, this is a map of the partitioning of Africa from 1885 after the Berlin Conference up until the beginning of World War I. And you see that it is almost entirely 
colonized. In 1870, about 10% of Africa had been colonized, whereas by 1895, approximately 90% had come under European colonial control in what is often referred to as the scramble for Africa. So this literally corresponds to the early years of cinema and thinking about and thinking through uh, the relationships between uh, the media that we study and these kinds of activities and interventions and brutalities and genocides and you know, horrors in many ways uh, is really significant to consider. So uh, Gracia was kind enough to visit my class and talk about the relationship between colonialism and the founding of the British Film Institute. And I will let her <laughs> say more about that if she wishes. Um, many key premises uh, were consolidated over the, the teaching of the course. And this is a kind of a list of some of the key ones. Uh, continent was portrayed for Western audiences as an exotic land without history or culture. And this without history or culture is really key and uh, something we need to interrogate uh, for a long time. Ethnographic films conveyed to audiences the absolute otherness of Africans and the imperative of colonialism as a civilizing mission. Again, these are probably things you're familiar with, but they really um, come alive, if you will, um, in the archive. Um, great quote by Mary Louise Pratt, imperial protocols of seeing appropriated other lands into European schemes of possession, enjoyment, and desire. Colonial ways of seeing Africa, Africa became the way to see Africa for audiences worldwide and often for Africans themselves. And this is part of the significance uh, as Abubakar laid out so clearly in his lecture regarding um, the rise of African cinema, cinema made by Africans themselves. African cinema therefore exists often, if not always, as a kind of post-colonial visual pedagogy with attempts to wrestle Africa and African bodies from the colonial scopic regime and colonial ways of seeing, to innovate African ways of seeing and re-signify Africa. So this is a lot of what I'm referring to as this parallax that provided us a very specific set of lenses to re-understand uh, these historical films. So I have a selection of some of these films and they indicate certain kinds of genres. Um, it's not everything that we, most of what we covered in the class, as you might imagine, was not silent cinema. But the, the examples that do exist from silent cinema are really uh, quite instructive and, and lead to a kind of uh, web of uh, genres and, and uh, emphases. This is, I'm not entirely sure how I'm gonna play this. Nope. Let's see what happens. This is Teddy Roosevelt on expedition in Kenya and Pathé News bragging about its completely ubiquitous coverage of all of So this is a great example of one of the major genres, particularly in the silent period, but also well into the 50s, um, that for the newsreels, uh, part of what was news was somebody from the West, almost always a member of European royalty, going to Africa. That's what was newsworthy. Um, sometimes uh, the royals and others constructed uh, the colonies into uh, virtual spaces that they could immerse themselves in. So in this instance, they're going next door, going to Paris. Is this playing yet? 
Oh. I'm not sure what's going on. Let's see. There we go. I hope that's fine. Yeah, so this is like virtual Cambodia. Incredible reconstruction that people, you can sense the scale of it. And of course, colonialism is always about scale. So Allison knows much more about this material than do I. But the part of what became uh, so interesting over the teaching the course is how the notion of virtual spaces and virtual constructions of Africa are completely resonant with the material that we were finding. Um, so this is one sort of extreme example. This is a, a terrific example of how the West depicted Africa as having no history or being frozen in time. It's very similar to some of the issues that Allison was raising about Native American culture in this country. Um, this is depicting uh, quote unquote Arabs and literally says they are inside one historical chronotope. I'm not sure. Okay, let me try and go back. Let's see. Yeah. There are many examples of this kind of shot in the silent era films and well into the 30s. Um, I think this resonates with the Mary Louise Pratt uh, notion of the promontory view. Um, it's actually kind of ordinary perhaps in uh, documentary terms, in newsreel terms, but it really is quite a, a consistent trope. The title cards are essential to providing the point of view that is intended. And again, I'm not entirely sure what the overall purpose of this newsreel was. It didn't seem to be um, especially topical, especially since it's claiming these people are primarily outside of history. But the but it's contrasted with, and I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, I don't have some attendant clips that demonstrate this. It's contrast, contrasted with more technological and scientistic documentaries that talk about um, the mineral deposits and especially the oil that's under the ground, which is pretty much the real reason that they're in this part of the world in the first place. Um, this is part two of that and has its own kind of exotic agenda. Could not have guessed that they taste like chicken, but I guess everything does. Um, ultimately. The, the cinematography in, in these films can actually be quite beautiful. So as aesthetic objects, they're interesting and at the same time, uh, troubling. You know, there's something um, to be questioned about the uh, extraction, if you will. There's it, everything about Africa and colonialism is about extractive economies. And uh, while I think there's always something valuable in attending to aesthetics, it, you also need to kind of throw a flag on certain kinds of aesthetics. 
Okay. Um, one of the most interesting discoveries was a series of films. These are from the National Archive um, from the Harmon Foundation. And the Harmon Foundation, I basically had to kind of reverse engineer what was readily available about the Harmon Foundation. And I'm guessing that there are others who know more than I. But they were very important ultimately in sponsoring African-American art exhibits. Um, they got started in this kind of attention um, to Africans and African-Americans as a, 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 col a collaboration of societies regarding missionary work. And this series, it's a short, it's a three-part series about Africa Joins the World was their first endeavor. And again, comes back to this fascinating sense of virtual worlds. They, to put this first series together, they shot nothing, or so the, the scholarship suggests. And they put out a call for all footage of Africa that they could get their hands on. And they created these quote unquote documentaries about Africa and the need for um, missionary work and you know sort of white man's burden saving of these uh, these poor people who wouldn't otherwise have a future. Um, it's a very rudimentary kind of work and at the same time takes its time detailing these people and why it's necessary for them to intervene. So this is, I'm gonna run a clip from part two, how Africa lives. And I'll be talking more about this. Abubakar and I are presenting at uh, Orphans next week. And I'll be talking more about this there. I wanna see, can I fast forward? Uh, Mark, excuse me. Um, may I kindly ask you to wrap, wrap up. up your presentation within the next two, three minutes? Um, yes, yes, not a problem at all. Um, I don't know if it's going to allow me to. Move forward. Doesn't look like it. OK, um, part of what's interesting about this uh, section is that ultimately it talks about Livingstone and has a quite elaborate representation of Livingstone. I guess I'll have to say more about this at, uh, at Orphans, including a, a, an amazing graphic of him straddling uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And it, it, it's its own version of that famous image of John Rhodes uh, straddling the entire con uh, con continent. Yeah, it's not gonna let me fast forward, okay. Uh, that's the gist of my presentation and I'm happy to take more questions. I do have, uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll do one more slide, which is talking about uh, MEP as a digital humanities project. So we're responding to this significant absence of digital tools in the arts and humanities. We promote an ethics of networked collegiality uh, we know that a lot of DH work is translation work across disciplines and vocabularies and nations, always respecting difference. We encourage experimentation in uh, methodologies and workflow. We do not expect all of these methodologies to neatly cohere into kind of whole cloth uh, projects. I love this phrase, uh, we're practicing dialectics without synthesis. Uh, certainly, we hope to achieve some kinds of synthesis, ultimately. And we uh, advocate for critical annotations, time-based annotations, which help in curation and preservation issues and progress, but also promote a pedagogy, contemporary pedagogy, that I think is really important, that fights against what we might call the blur of attention culture. There's a worldwide movement called Slow Cinema, responding to the, um, 
extraordinary effects, deleterious effects of attention culture. And our project uh, feels uh, allied with that. Um, so we do address text issues, but also sound and image culture, which is really our field. We uh, applaud research methods that newly engage audiences. In addition to scholars, I love Bernard Stiegler's notion of the need to re-enchant our relationship to history. And of course, we engage with that central dialectic of uh, close reading versus distant reading. So those are some of the ways that we also address the, um, the important questions that the conference has posed. And I'll be happy to talk more about that later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for your presentation and linking some of the um, issues that uh, we've be we've begun um, raising to issues of pedagogy and to the important project, digital humanities project of uh, of MEP. Um, let me take my chance to apologize for um, mispronouncing the name of one of the archives that uh, Mark's presentation referred to in my presentation of uh, Mark's uh, paper, the Sherman Greenberg archive. And thanks, Mark, for mentioning uh, my lecture within the Idea of Africa course at Dartmouth, which was an amazing and inspiring um, experience and course. Um, and um, I also would like to take my chance once again to apologize to all of uh, you in attendance for having uh, variated a bit the number of presentations. I, I withdrew my presentation in this panel for um, personal, um, due to personal circumstances. But uh, I hope that we can continue this conversation um, about the right to access uh, expropriated images and the distribution of scoping agency through um, the remediation of memory. Uh, and I'm thinking also about some of the methodologies that we've uh, discussed, that Alison and Mark have discussed in um, uh, remediating that memory uh, that is in the in, in heritage, in contested heritage um, and archival visual records. Um, but um, I would like to now leave the floor to um, Abu Bakr Sanogo that uh, will um, tell us more about uh, um, Albert Samama Chikli, um, an African pioneer of cinema, as the title of his uh, paper um, elucidates. And uh, I will leave the floor to you, Abu Bakr, and then we can uh, uh, meet back for a Q&A. I think that we might have uh, Bubakar, are you there? Issue. I think that we might have some issue because I see that uh, Abubakar's um, mic is unmuted, yet we can't. Oh, come on. There you go. There you Everyone go. Can you hear me now? We heard yes, that. We yep. can. Uh, so I was, I was saying that, uh, well, thank you, Gracia. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark. Thank you, Alison. Uh, I was saying that for some reason, Zoom cannot find my camera today. So uh, you would at least hear me, but I'll remain invisible. Um, and I hope it's not a sign of uh, a symptom of other things. Um, so it's a great pleasure for me, honestly, to be here at Domitor uh, with my esteemed colleagues and everybody, all the attendants. I have to say that it's been a long time coming. Uh, it's my very first uh, Domitor, uh, yet I heard about it, I think, back in 1998, as far back when I was moving from the University of Iowa, where I had a sort of visiting fellowship and moving to Washington, D.C. to work as a programmer. 
And I was leaving, I went to say bye to the faculty. And of course, Rick Altman, who was there, I think was an organizer that year, said, well, see you at Domitor. I believe that year the society was meeting at Library of Congress, so I didn't get to attend uh, because I was slowly settling into my new city and my new role. But heard about it, of course, from Pat Lockney at the time, who mentioned the meeting in the famous 63 Seed Theater. So this is the first that I said, and I hope it's the first of many. So I want to start by saying, by at least a certain why this conference matters to me. Uh, because of course, I consider myself a historian of the cinema with an emphasis on Africa, a part of the world that has not always been featured prominently in film historical discourse, and certainly less so in the part of the cinema Domitor tends to focus on primarily, that is early and silent cinema. Uh, as an aside, last night in preparing my paper, I decided to take advantage of the wonderful archive of the Domitor Conference presentation since 1990 in Quebec and did a quick research for the term Africa and could hardly find any. Uh, I think most entries related to African Americans primarily. Of course, I'm sure Africa has been discussed before under probably the umbrella, the anthropological, the ethnographic, maybe the colonial, or maybe the names of individual countries. But there seem to be, it seems at least, it is something of a structuring lack in terms of a sufficient and significant African presence. Uh, perhaps this means that uh, I and many others will have our work cut out for ourselves. Uh, but my research over the past few decades has uh, increasingly convinced me that Africa has played an important role in the history of cinema since its emergence in a multiplicity of ways, matters and form. And this probably should be better reflected, hopefully, in the program, perhaps in a more activist manner than currently is the case. I hope my presentation will modestly make uh, contribute to making that case. So the point of departure for this research on early cinema, of which the cinema of Alavesa much strictly is but an example, is part of a desire to solve for me a historiographic question, that is, how does one attempt to write and present an extensive, uh, comprehensive is a bit of a broad term, but a more or less comprehensive, but not totalizing history, but moving in this practice on the African continent. Uh, this is a cardinal question is then that uh, contemporary hegemonic historiography, in, in contemporary hegemonic historiography, there's a kind of caesura that's placed in African film history in terms of the before and the after independence from colonial rule. According to it, uh, at least, uh, by, by the way, can I share my screen? Let me see, uh, as well. Uh, let's see if I should be able to, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, let me see. Okay, okay, here, share. Look at something. Uh, can you see this? Yes, we can. It's working. Great. All right. Um, so, this is a cardinal question. They said that uh, contemporary uh, hegemonic historiography. Uh, has it a caesura, so to speak, that's placed on African domination in terms of the before and after independence from colonial rule, according to it, at least for a very long time, and still for many people today, the independence period of African cinema is the time and the site of aberrance because it coincides with a much reviled colonial period, which in some ways is better forgotten, really, in light of its cruel violence. Mark has alluded to that already. In this narrative, of course, the preferred period is the post-independent period where Africans and their countries exercise important modalities of agency on the global scene and figures such as Usman Samben are able to emerge as fathers or founding fathers of African cinema. Now, this Azura has, of course, important implications because it ipso facto marginalizes at least 65 years of moving image history on the continent and involving Africa. This means that we need to obtain a relative, we tend to obtain a relatively shorter and a truncated version of moving image history. Yet, if we were to master the courage to interrogate and revisit this very site of aberrant that is the colonial, of course, we can't do it uh, naively. We have to pinch our nose. 
hold our breath in order to avoid the smelling uh, smelling once again the rotten, putrid, and death-carrying stench of colonialism that emanates from this vast corpus of colonialism, which in fact, according to some, may consider a very important uh, constitute a very important portion of early and silent cinema. Then in that context, what, what, what would such a gesture make cause? Among other things, I think it would involve not only the history of film production by Africans, of course, at the management, but also the history of other modalities of the involvement of Africans in Africa with holding image practice. With this gesture, coupled supported with the epistemological posture of examining film history and historiography by taking Africa as a point of departure, I argue that boulevards arguably may arguably open up to other regions of film history. Um, other figures, other practices, other histories, other narratives may also be able to emerge uh, by these new discursive conditions of possibility to paraphrase this well-known French philosophy. In that context, it's important to underline, of course, therefore, that Africa's relationship to the cinema dates back to the very first days of idiom, from the human motion studies to the first world tours of the Lumiere operators, on a mission to introduce the cinematograph to the world and bring the very world to the doorsteps of their audiences. In this context, the desire by Africans to domesticate this technology of modernity, which paradoxically came to the continent, as obvious, I think I've said by Mark already, it came to the continent in the suitcases of colonialism. Though that desire therefore already, already to domesticate this technology, and uh, which was symptomatic of a will to agency which belied the notion that they cannot represent themselves. Now, uh, Albert Samamashiki therefore becomes one important example in this attempt to intervene in these uh, discussions. And so I'll briefly give you a sense of uh, his uh, itinerary, um, the itinerary and some of the work he did and what this what are some of the implications yeah okay so he was born uh, I think some of you may know of course uh, in 1872 in Ottoman Tunisia so he became a French protectorate who at this point the age of empire a decade before of course the Berlin conference that Mark mentioned which was sealed the fate of African of the African continent for many generations. Uh, born in a wealthy, wealthy Jewish Tunisian family, which had also acquired French nationality. Uh, he was, unlike the majority of Tunisians, uh, able to navigate both the colonized and the colonizing world, uh, arguably pioneering the trope of the hyphen that would become a major dimension of cinema in the age of globalization of a century later. A man both up and ahead of his time, he was in this age of modernity and triumph of technological innovation, he made the technophile open to and embracing the latest advances. In this context, he adopted, I think, the uh, cordless photograph, uh, the radio, the bicycle, the x-ray, with which he offered three consultations and treatment for the poor. Photography and indeed the cinema would be, however, the technologies he would be most he would most durably use and for which he would earn international recognition. So the photo that you see here is somewhere in this uh, study. You see on the wall of a sort of uh, blown up photograph that he himself has taken over the years during his multiple travels. He was really a world travel figure. So about photography and cinema, therefore, as often happened in the process of adoption of new technologies, one of the first phases is that of experimentation. And he would go on to experiment with both photography and cinema. In photography, for example, he was known to have been an adept of photomontage, sometimes in a playful way, as when he, for example, offered portraits of famous figures with pigs, donkey buddies, for example. He also recreated the famous Partida Cat scene, uh, which, of course, we also see in Miel and Elias' very first films. And unlike these two, his mise en scène is a sort of mise en theme of himself playing against himself. Um, Abubakar, uh, Abubakar yes. apologies 
for interrupting. Um, uh, Elif uh, Rankin Kainakchi was just asking in the uh, chat, are we supposed to see the other slides? Because we are only seeing the first, um, the cover slide. Yes, uh, you will ask, we will see the other slide when I get to that point, very soon. Very apologies, soon. apologies. No no, 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 but, but, but you're, you're right. In fact, I don't have the, you know, have the book where the photograph that illustrates all these are, but I, I, I don't have the physical photograph, so. In, Apologies. That's why Apologies. I can't show it, right. Um, so uh, where are we? Uh, so Tunisia, of course, uh, in terms, of course, of uh, placement in relation to the, uh, Sort of the advent of the cinema or the emergence, shall we say, of the cinema. Of course, we know that there were early screenings in Tunisia. Um, uh, he's known to have been among one of the first, he was not the first to have uh, done screenings in Tunisia. He was among one of the first, among the first uh, as early, I think, as 1887. We know that, of course, Alexandre Tromio, who was uh, the Lumière's main operator. Uh, ended up in Tunisia and also in 1887, uh, uh, between, between yeah, December 1896 and April 1887. Uh, now, while it's not, okay, we also know that, yes, I should go to that. So this, this is a slide that will illustrate the fact that was an exhibitor. So he essentially, it was not a fixed theater that he had, but he would rent a space from films in this in, in these theaters, in these theaters. Uh, so his theater was referred to as the Cinema to Shikli, named after the island of Shikli, which is an island in Tunisia that uh, apparently his father purchased from the Bay of Tunis. Um, there you go. So, so his propensity, therefore, to domesticate uh, technology would lead him to refer to his cinematograph, because he purchased, of course, end up purchasing a cinematograph, which we would refer to as the shufograph, shuf meaning look, or the lookograph, if you want to translate it in English. So with this newly acquired cinematograph, uh, he would, of course, uh, perform a number of experimentations, um, including, um, you know, uh, going into a submarine, for example, as early as 1903, plunging 40 meters deep in the ocean with both his foot and camera. Um, of course, along with other people, including somebody called Abbott Rao, uh, therefore, thereby taking uh, some of the very first underwater camera shots. He's not the first, I have to highlight, but definitely among the first that I know because a recreation of that time, for example, by Méliès or others, uh, show, of course, more, uh, more artificial tank setting, so to speak. So here, later in 1908, of course, you would film cities, Paris, Brussels, from Cote Balloon, uh, claiming, of course, to have been the first one, but again, we have evidence that he's not the one, the first. You also use the cinema for scientific purposes by studying the area of spiders and scorpions with his cameras. And his long standing interest in astronomy led him to film a lunar eclipse and uh, photograph the Haley Comet on October 19, 1940. Now, Chicli would also go on to document, of course, the nation, so to speak. So social, the social, political, and cultural life around him. He was, I must say, also, of course, a correspondent of uh, many prominent uh, newsreel, I would say, studios, frankly, at the time, including Pate and Gomo. So I can show you, for example, some of the exchanges he had, for example, from Pate here. This is a 1922 letter from Pate. Uh, uh, saying that they just received the negatives of, a fail, of the filming of the funerals of the Bay of Tunis, for example, who were um, so these are 
other correspondences of purchasing of, of purchasing him. This, for example, is the negatives of again uh, funerals of somebody called Captain Adam. Uh, here, let me see if I can increase this a little bit. You have again uh, Captain Adam, for example. Uh, here you have a uh, letter from a first page, yeah. a message from Mr. Leon Gaumont himself to him about, of course, uh, the fact that Gaumont will provide him with um, film stock so that he could make uh, film elements that he would send back only and exclusively to Gaumont and nobody else. Because of course he was working, as you can see, for Pate, but also for Gaumont and also for Eclair. So these are some of the correspondences, the sort of detail, the specific, uh, the specific aspect in which uh, the contract with Gaumont worked out. So another. And another message from Beaumont again uh, about what they owe to him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All these to simply say, in a word, that of course he was is part of the Beaumont archive. Here, for example, you have a list of some of the films he has contributed to 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 the company. Let me try to increase it so we can see some of the some of the links here. For example, Pesh Omero. Uh, navigation, the tapi. Anyway, he, this is his own handwriting, so it's not always clear. Uh, but uh, these are some of the films, or at least some of the footage he contributed to uh, uh, Gomo actually. So. All right. Um, of course, uh, he was also. Um, in 1914, of course, with the advent of the second decade of the century, he got involved in, on the war front, of course, on the African continent, of course, in major in uh, Libya and later in Algeria and Tunisia, and of course, finally on the European front. Uh, in Libya, for example, in 1911, so just a few years before uh, World, World War I, he was dispatched to, to Libya from Paris upon the beginning of the Italo Turkish War, and somebody else is presenting this. And uh, he faced difficulties, for example, from the Italians who considered him a spy. And he made a film actually called La Prise du Capture. So capture. But of course, uh, he joined because he had French citizenship. So he joined on January 5, 1916. The French Army Film Unit. So these are the members of the so-called French Army Unit. So among them, uh, you may recognize. I certainly recognize the figure of uh, Leon Poirier, who was a quite famous um, colonial film, colonial East filmmaker, so to speak. There was Louis Feuillade, a painter, also along alongside Abel Cast. I don't know about Abel, but definitely Louis Feuillade. Now, initially, he sent both to Algeria, where he filmed military action in the mountains, and Tunisia, where he filmed pioneer camps and military vessels in that in, in desert, to be dispatched on the European front, filming such locations as Verdun, including hundreds from Tunisia, uh, sorry, the site of a major battle with no less than 700 casualties, including hundreds from Tunisia and the rest of the African continent. Some other battlefields he filmed, including the Oman, the Somme, the Ardennes, the Rennes, etc. And among others, he shot combat, combat, training exercises, troop arrivals, visits to the front by dignitaries, etc. I don't know if uh, I can show just some clips while uh, reading this. Uh, for example, some of his war footage. You can try, yes. I will try. Do you see anything? Okay, I guess I'll stop sharing first and then and then uh, try this again. Okay, can you see anything? We can. 
Okay, fantastic. Now, these are some of the battle scenes. So this page, of course, uh, I don't have direct access to the footage. Of course, we can talk about issues of copyright and so on and so forth. Uh, so I was able to access it through a program that I co-curated in Bologna at the Cinema Retrovato Film Festival in Bologna in 2015. And uh, one of the wonderful things that they did, I was very happy with it. I was going to talk about copyrights as well, but you know, they filmed the screen upon which the films were being. And so that's what, that's the only reason why I'm able to show these images today. Of course, the, the, the event, the series involved, um, I mean, there was live accompaniment on the side and you can hear the live accompaniment. So these, these are the, some of the, some of the scenes that we filmed while uh, being on the, on the So, uh, Military exercises, the visit generals on the front. Um, so you can see these masks uh, that, uh, of course, uh, were so important. I think that have been discussed by others. This is a shell shot, of course. Uh, so there's protecting protecting themselves against. She that come out of it. Uh, I, I want to even forward here to show you a so these are all some of the images here. It was literally on the battlefield. And here you can see, for example, how uh, in the distance, in many cases, you can see in fact uh, bombs literally falling in front of the, 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 the camera, camera itself. Um, see, oh, more so showing soldiers having their breaks in recreational mode, for example. Uh, then saying here, of course, you see, look in the distance. The, of course, it's very blurry, but if you look in the distance, you see, of course, smoke all the way in the, the background there. These are all uh, bombs that were essentially falling in front is that the camera couch. Uh, Abu Bakr, may I kindly yeah. ask you to wrap up within the next two, yeah. just two minutes? Or two to bit? three minutes. Okay, very good. Okay, so let me try to do that. Screen again. Okay, so he was part of this French uh, army so unit. Then, of course, after the war, he returned to Tunisia. Uh, he demobilized and decided to focus his attention on making fiction films. And he would go on to direct, of course, his first uh, feature, first a short, and that is Zora. And then here, let me introduce this, uh, his first uh, feature called uh, The Girl from Carthage, yeah, 1924. Uh, with his uh, with his daughter playing the lead role. So these are some of the comments about the release of the film, the person in the film, with the actors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, more information about so he was featured in Cine Miroir for those of you who are specialists of that period. Here you see Pearl White on the cover, and in it uh, you have of course a comment on girl from Carthage. Etc. Uh, yeah, and then, of course, he would die a decade later in 1934, I believe. Uh, this is a photograph of his uh, tomb, and and uh, with the, the following epigraphs on um, epitaph. Sorry, so that was a World War veteran. He won lots of medals. Highly curious, very courageous, audacious. Uh, Okay, so I'd like to therefore uh, uh, go over very quickly of some of the implications for this, at least for me. So as I said, the project originates from the recognition of an absence of Africa in most scholarly accounts in early and South cinema, the primary focus of Europe and North America, and that contribute to redress this imbalance by exploring ways in which inserting the pioneering African figure in this narrative may help interrogate. 
so indeed, a stake in Shikli's rehabilitation is the possibility to raise questions about um, ranging from his potential contribution to filmic language, I don't know which one, film technology to the relationship between science and cinema, his status as a pioneer of the documentary form and his contribution to the creation of the grammar of film and uh, It, of course, uh, among other things, help us uh, uh, participate in inserting Africa in the narrative of the emergency institutionalization of cinema and has implication not only for the global history of cinema, but of course, histories of cinema from several countries, including Tunisia, France, with residences in Nigeria, Libya, Britain, Italy, etc. Uh, it therefore uh, uh, will help contribute to transforming that narrative and imply that Africa, alongside Europe and North America, is one of the indispensable stopovers in its scholarly and rigorous effort to map the global history of cinema at the moment, of the moment and of course, uh, at the moment and immediately after it, uh, its uh, emergence. Um, it also helps, uh, among other things, to interrogate the area studies approach to film history by demonstrating that it is impossible to fully account for French film history, European film history, without including aspects of African history, and conversely, that Tunisian film and African film history may also in part be part of French film history, uh, of uh, European and North American film histories and other. And so for African cinema, obviously it helps us reperiodize uh, African film history. And of course the questions of pioneering figures have to move of course from Saint Ben all the way to the beginning of the 20th century, or, even the end of the 19th century figures by Albert Sampachipi, um, among other things. I think I'll just give it there. Just for the sake. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Abubakar, uh, for uh, your fascinating presentation. And uh, I would like to invite um, all attendees to drop your questions in the Q&A. Um, yes, wow. Um, OK, we have a first question from uh, um, Rafael de Luna Freire, and I will read it if that is OK. Um, is that what you were suggesting, Martin, that I can read the question? Yes, yes. All right, OK. Um, so Raphael begins by congratulating Abu Bakr uh, for, uh, his, for on his presentation. I think it is very important, your, inter your interest in still un understudied early film pioneers outside Europe or the US. My question is, if the creation of cinema coincided with European imperialism, how can we contribute to avoid that scholarship on early cinema uh, doesn't, is not contaminated with uh, the same Eurocentrism that take continents as Africa or Latin America only as objects of a foreigner gaze, um, be it of the colonizer and its filmmaker or of the contemporary scholar? Thank you very much, Raphael, for that very uh, important and pertinent question. So I would, uh, uh, I would uh, invite Abubakar to um, address this question uh, if he so wishes, and then uh, we, we can, I suppose, also ask Mark and Alison if they want to um, address that uh, epistemological, such a key question that Raphael asked there. Thank you, Raphael. Excellent question. Well, in fact, I would argue that, I would argue that uh, the field is already contaminated by your century by virtue of the, 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 the bulk of the objects that come under the study, simply it's primarily, as I mentioned, films from Europe and North America that are both in this conference and press conferences. Society. Uh, one, the, one of the first things uh, that at least I hope and hope we globally speak, people from what, what people refer to as the global south, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, 
maybe participate in inaugurating maybe a second age, second cinema. Uh, in simply helping decolonize cinema, right? I, for example, was always, I always had a bit of reservation, for example, around the concept of uh, the cinema of attraction, for example, as being sort of such a bulk or count of this huge period from you know, beginnings till 1907, 1908. While, of course, it makes a reference to the kinds of films that Mark and others were talking about, I feel like there's more to the period than simply attractions. I feel that the period in fact was highly political. It was sutured and suffused. It was the colonial age for Christ. And so there, it was any, I mean, attraction to me was even to a some extent an open phenomenon if I want to, if, if, if I really want to, want to, to, to be in Arshan on it. Of course, there was attraction, but attractions for what purposes? So Africans, for example, were in zoos, as you know very well. We are, Africans have to make their, find their, their first images. They have to go to the zoo in Lyon or Paris, where the Lumiere camera came. Now, Yes, of course, they are attractions, no doubt, to the spectators on the other side of the fence, of course. And of course, the film themselves participate in the, that, that, that notion of trying. But there was more to it than that. They were there precisely to be as visible evidence of the de their defeat, the defeat of their colonizing and the anchor, conquering their country. And so, the, it, even if we, we, let's say, still adhere to this notion of the same, right? Uh, in many ways, uh, the, it was both attraction, but in order, of course, to create a kind of ideological, if you will, uh, justification, if you will, for the colonial. That can never uh, understand. So, uh, I, so in some way, the politicis, they need to politicize, to further politicize the attractional moment seems to me one of the key ways in which we could in fact help go in the direction that you are in fact calling for by interrogating its friends. You remember that when it was proposed, it was in part to also sort of skirt away from the over-politicization and ideologization of the cinema and ideology debate of the 1970s, you called it well. Well, cinema and ideology, in fact, cinema was, as I said, came to Africa in the suitcases of colonialism. So ideology is there always and ready. So we can't, it, so, so going back to a kind of, I would say, relatively uh, innocent moment of cinema, uh, to me, uh, poses many, many problems. And I think that's arguably one of the ways in which we may uh, start to, 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 to counter, if you will, the Eurocentrism of, of, of the, even the study of that period by offering alternative narratives. Alternative narratives. Uh, not to mention, of course, taking into account the bulk of films made in that period. Don't forget that the British, um, the British, um, let's say film institution, film archival institutions a couple of years ago, let's say a decade ago, over a decade ago, had come up with a figure of 6,000 that had something to do with the colonial period. And if you add to them the Italian, the German, the French, the Belgian, the Portuguese, the Spanish, etc. My God. So you can see that you have lists made up to eight to 10,000. So you have, in fact, a solid body of work of early and silent cinema, so 10,000 films. 
Can you imagine? Is in fact colonial cinema and therefore has to be re-interrogated in order to really more fully comprehensive. Um, sorry for stepping in so uh, immediately after your um, really very generative answer, I think, um, Abu Bakr, and this is a really important conversation and I hope that we can incorporate some of this into um, our next conference, um, maybe about colonial um, archival, the colonial archive, perhaps. Um, but uh, I was, um, I think that there was a uh, slight misunderstanding at the start of the panel that we would have time until quarter two, the hour, and instead we should be wrapping up. So I was just wondering whether we have, in fact, another question which I would like to. Um, to read aloud, if we can, Martin, can we take at least five minutes? Yes, that's fine. Five minutes is fine. Thank you. I'll read it really fast. Uh, thank you, Abu Bakar. I had two comments. It is important to stress the ambiguity of Albert Samama, who used to navigate between identities and juggle identities to his advantage. As a matter of fact, he rarely identified as a Tunisian or an African, and for instance, presented himself as a Frenchman to the Arab and Ottoman soldiers in Tripolitania. On the contrary, when negotiating with the French film companies, he highlighted uh, his Tunisian origins and his mastery of Arabic. That is another um, very per pertinent question. And I would like also to apologize to, to Mark and Alison for um, kind of taking away their opportunity to address the former question. Um, shall we go just with a round of very quick observations or comments that uh, all the panelists might want to make to this broad question of how to address the um, contested uh, mm -hmm. heritage that we are talking about here. So going like in the same order of presentation, Alison, would you like to perhaps sure. offer your contribution here to this question? Yes, yeah, sure. sure. Thank you. And thanks to um, Mark and Abubakar for those really fascinating presentations. Um, I'll just be very brief. I mean, I think, you know, decolonializing practices and film studies, um, there's not one single um, sort of epistemological kind of model or heuristic. Um, I mean, to me, what's a really intriguing concept is uh, re-engagement. Um, and that form of re-engagement can be um, obviously using oral history, as I have done. It can be through the form of museum e exhibits that bring in contemporary indigenous interlocutors. I mean, I think what we need to do is to just trouble, um, I think the ap apparent sort of certitude of the image um, and to look for cracks, to look for sutures, to look for ways to kind of think about the partiality of the image in terms of not necessarily telling the whole story. I mean, the danger with that is of course, you then sort of downplay the colonial context. So I think, it's clearly um, imperative for us to, to sort of not um, sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, and, and to sort of downplay um, the kind of incredibly violent, oppressive uh, moments in which um, many of these films were made. But as I think, as my presentation showed, I mean, there's, there's a great deal of contested counter history and counter, counter narrative um, that we can extrapolate, I think, from the image through doing textual analysis that I think um, raises questions about the potential openness of these texts, right? That they're, um, you know, quite uh, semiotically sort of rich and, and dense. Um, but then bringing in, bringing in, in bringing in indigenous voice, I think, is, is just an incredibly important way. And, you know, I'm just sort of scratching the surface with many of the films that I'm looking at with regards to um, returning them to communities um, and inviting them to kind of really grapple with um, the difficult memories, but also some of the kind of joyous memories that these films evoke. So I'll stop there. Yeah, that's great. And thank you both Allison and uh, Abubakar for your fantastic papers. I, I think that uh, I, I'll say a couple of three things. The work that Allison that you're doing with Native American communities is essential. The part of the, what it opens up as questions of genuine address regarding archives and access to archives 
is that we can't just have one call for open access or don't digitize it. Native American communities are the ideal example of people for whom their archive is sacred and they nevertheless need to be preserved and enabled via various digital uh, kinds of opportunities. Um, and to, to uh, I really want our tool to be used in the kinds of complex reading ways that you were articulating and uh, that our Bubakar is also articulating. I think the, yeah, I return to uh, deeply questioning um, the modalities of the cinema of attractions is essential. I've always felt that uh, the casual and multiple use of stereotypes, racist, sexist, colonialist stereotypes um, needs to be foregrounded in the evolution of a sense of what we mean by attractions. The, the whole notion of legibility in early cinema is greatly conditioned by the, again, the speed of recognition of horribly offensive stereotypes. And that speed of recognition and the faux solution to legibility that it provides is a critical aspect of early cinema that we need to consistently push back against and raise questions about. Um, I just, I'm, I'm grateful to you all for such a uh, fantastic conversation that I hope we continue. Um, I think that uh, we need to wrap it up there. Um, 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 Abu Bakr, I, I consider your uh, input as already having addressed this, uh, this question. Apologies for the um, involuntary soundtrack here. Um, <laughs> um, and I thank um, each uh, panelist here. Thank you very much, Martin, for uh, your untiring work uh, during the conference already at the second day. And uh, thank you very much all the attendees and apologies for some issues with time management. I hope we can continue this important conversation Francie, can I just say one quick thing? I apologize for not uh, putting in the um, YouTube clip, but if you just go on YouTube and put in ITIC, Into Travel Engine Ceremonial Gallop, there are plenty of um, videos that people have posted from the pre-pandemic moment, and they're just wonderful to watch. So mine was just one of many that you could look at, so just wanted to point that out to people. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Alison, for specifying that, especially as this panel is recorded, so people can check that reference. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the conference. I imagine Tammy will be with us soon. Well, uh, uh, who are we missing?